So, uh, good morning, everybody. The camera is not working here, so you won't be able to see me, people who are watching on YouTube. Um, the um, chapter, we started last week, the chapter on theories of demography. And I started talking to you about these uh, important terms in theory and in important terms to understand theory, not just in social sciences. Hey guys, hey, we started. Not, not just in social sciences, but in general, right? So all that discussion about what is theory and then from theory, you go to hypothesis and then you collect data and then you confirm or not your hypothesis. That's what all sciences do. Specifically for this uh, chapter, I just put some other videos here. This video here is just a funny video, kind of look like a, a video game that was done by Professor Matt Hauer from Florida State University. He's a professor in the sociology department there. It's just really funny to look this video after you read the chapter about theories of demography that he puts these different views of what, uh, what are the issues of population size, where their population size is an issue or not. He puts in a funny way as the, the theorists are talking to each other. So you can take a look at this. It's just a really short video there. And I asked him for the copy and I posted in, in the, in the, on YouTube. The, um, these other ones, by the Population Reference Bureau and by the American Museum of Natural History. These are kind of longer um, lectures or documentaries or um, videos talking about how we see population going into these next centuries, how it was, how did we achieve the levels that we have right now in terms of composition and so on. But it gives us I also good overview on what we know about population changes over time, right? So these two videos are also there in the course website available for you. The, um, yeah, so pretty much in the last lecture, uh, when I started the, this chapter, we just viewed this, slide here, pretty much showing that we have these major uh, ways to understand a specific research problem. And if you have a question that was already um, tested or in some way answered by other researchers in other time or in other countries, you can try to do the same thing for the country that you are studying or for more recent years. So in that case, you have previous knowledge and you do a deductive study. In other ways, if you don't have previous studies that try to investigate a similar research question as that you are trying to investigate now, maybe your research question is too new, it's a specific topic that nobody looked at it before, we start to do a more exploratory work. In this exploratory work, we start by observation, and then from the patterns that we observe in the, in the, in the data, we try to come with possible answers to our questions, and then they, if they become plausible as you test them, they can help build a theory. In that case, you, are, you start from a particular case, trying to build a bigger case, so you are doing an inductive study. And all these other ways here to show this diagram are pretty much showing the same thing. Usually, uh, deductive work is more based on quantitative data when we have a large amount of data being collected, but not necessarily, right? A lot of deductive work can be done or has been done already using qualitative work. But usually when you have uh, a topic that was not studied before, 
and you want to just go to that specific community to understand, for example, why that community was so affected by the pandemic, much more than other places, much more than other cities. So you try to go there and start talking to people because there is no data, no large data sets that were collected about that. So you can go there and start interviewing people. And what you're doing, you are collecting qualitative data, doing an observation to try to get patterns and have uh, some preliminary answers to your questions. And then you try to come up with this bigger theoretical framework. So right now, um, because of the nature of the pandemic that we are seeing in a more contemporary society in such a developed society, a lot of questions have been raised. For example, how people perceive the severity of the pandemic depending on who they trust, the media, uh, religious uh, leaders, or politicians, or family members, or friends. So those questions were not answered before. So we have to go into those specific people and collect information from them. We are doing a inductive work, not only because it's qualitative, because we are trying to answer a question that was not uh, tried to be answered before, okay? So that's the general idea. I just wanted to give this, this overview. And then now we go into specific discussions about uh, population, about demography, how uh, early writers uh, saw whether population growth was a good or a negative thing. So Ryder, back in 1964, he first was concerned about like, what is population, right? Let's try to describe what is population before we start to analyze it. So population is an aggregate of individuals defined in spatial and temporal terms. So population can be a population in a country, can be a state, can be a county, a city. So we just have to define the geographical space. Uh, and also the time. What is the time that I'm trying to analyze? When did I collect that data? Is it historical data? Or is it data from more uh, recent years? The population model is both microdynamic and macrodynamic. So population, the size of the population, the composition of the, pop the population, uh, the characteristics of the population, where people live, that is affected both by aggregated level uh, variables, let's say, but also individual level variables. Individual decisions to follow public health guidelines, individual decisions to want to move from one place to the other, individual decisions to uh, want to have children or not, individual decisions to want to get married, that affects how our population is composed. But at the same time, these individual decisions, they are affected by how our society is organized. It's affected by the aggregate levels, about by cultures, about by, it's uh, affected by the habits of this overall population, right? So whenever we do an analysis of population, what the, he emphasizes is that we should take into account both individual and aggregated level characteristics to understand why this population reached this point. Lotica uh, makes the distinction between persistent of the individual and aggregate. Human beings die while the population aggregate does not. Individuals will continue to enter the population uh, to replace those that are dying. So us as individuals, we are part of this population for a specific time point. And as we get older and then when we die, the population will uh, continue to exist, right? And, or at least the world population will continue to exist. And this is material from uh, that John Wick's book. And it's just to show that actually human beings started to think about this 
basic demographic questions a long time ago. So even in the Bible, in Genesis, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The idea that no control in fertility. Let's have a lot of children. Let's uh, have a lot of a bigger population on earth. And that will be good for all human beings. So all these things that we read in centuries, thousands of years ago, they were, they are in some way related to how we think population should be. So they are all a little bit more normative because there is no empirical analysis being done there. But what's interesting is to understand that human beings started to think about the issues of population for a long time. Confucius, government should maintain balance between population and resources. So there is a little bit more cautious. So yeah, we should have a bigger population, but we also have limited resources to provide food and place to live for these people. So we have to be a little bit more concerned about that. Plato, population quality is more important than quantity. So in his case, he's um, kind of supporting more the idea that we should be fewer people, but because then we will have more resources to invest on that smaller population. Aristotle, population should be limited. Abortion might be appropriate. Same thing, right? So always these philosophers and trying to understand how our population should be and why it should be that way, right? So, but these are all like more done in a philosophical point of view. It's not scientific in the case, in the sense that they are not collecting data from the population and tests and their hypothesis is more normative, right? It's more normative in the sense that that's what they think the population should be because that would fall uh, what they think about the population in the terms of we should have a better quality of life for the fewer people than having a bigger population. Caesar, population growth is necessary to maintain the Roman Empire, right? So for that case, the Roman Empire needed slaves, and so they would continue the wars to have more slaves. And also, the population should keep growing to exactly have more labor force to, to make the empire keep going. St. Augustine, abstinence is preferred way to deal with sexuality. Second best is to marry and procreate. So this uh, discussion by St. Augustine is it's kind of like really linked to the propositions that Malthus does later on. And Malthus is someone that we're gonna talk more in detail because he pretty much also he, like his whole thing is exactly that. We should be concerned about population growing too much and we not having enough resources to provide to the population. But how do we control the population growth? Through abstinence and through people are marrying later in their lives, right? So really this population theory build really being influenced by their religious beliefs, right? St. Thomas Aquinas, celibacy is not better than marriage and procreation. So it's just, again, all being done in a more normative way, in a more philosophical way of how the population should be and how we should um, try to prevent increases in population size. Uh, Caldun, population growth increases occupational specialization and raises income. So as population developed, we started to see that um, as we start to increase the size of the population, we don't need as many people working on specific tasks, on specific fields of the economy, on agriculture or on uh, making clothes or on um, 
making modes of transportation and so on. So we have to divide the labor. So as population grows in size, we start to see more specialization, people working on specific tasks, on specific occupations. Mercantilism, increasing national wealth depends on a growing population that can stimulate trade. Mercantilism was that idea that then you have all these different nations that some of them pro, uh, have a bigger production of specific goods, and we have to have this market between them. And this market is going to be more fruitful if we have a bigger population that demands all these products from different nations. The physiocrats, population size depends upon the wealth of the land, which is stimulated by free trade, the so-called laissez-faire. So the idea that, again, we should let the economy don't have major regulations from the government, and uh, depending on how good we do in the economy and how good our land is where we live, the population would prosper or not, and that would influence the size of the population. And some more modern theories, and then those we're going to discuss more in depth in the following uh, slides throughout this chapter. Malthus, population grows exponentially, really fast, while our capacity to produce food grows, but it grows arithmetically, a much slower pace. So if population grows much faster than our capacity of producing food, that will result in poverty. So poverty will be the result uh, in the absence of moral restraint. Moral restraint, the sense of people having too many more kids than what actually that society is capable of dealing with. In these uh, studies by Malthus actually influence a lot of studies in more recent years, even like contemporary demographers, a lot of them are really influenced by Malthus. Maybe they don't call themselves as new Malthusians, but they are still concerned with the size of the population and the resources that we have available. Malthus, like I said, he had a really strong religious background. So his way of trying to make population should not grow as fast was through abstinence or delaying marriage. The new Malthusians, they say, actually, we can uh, use birth control as an appropriate measure to uh, avoid rapid population growth. Because then the new Malthusians are the same way as Malthus concerned with population size and resources, but they don't have those moral restraints as Malthus has from his religious beliefs. So they say birth control is acceptable, right? And uh, the studies by Marx, each society has its own law of population that determines consequences of population growth and poverty is not the natural result of population growth. And here, again, I'm going to go in more in depth about this, but say, what is Malthus saying? Malthus saying up there that population grows so much faster than our capacity to produce food that will cause poverty. Population growth is the independent variable. Poverty is the dependent variable, right? Population growth causing poverty. Marx turns that around and he says, no, actually poverty, lack of knowledge to have birth control and lack of opportunities in our lives will make us not control our population size. We will tend to have more kids Usually, even nowadays, uh, less educated people and even people with lower socioeconomic status have more kids on average. So poverty actually affects population size. So Marx turns it around by saying that poverty is the independent variable and population growth is the dependent variable. 
right? But what most demographers try to do nowadays is to combine these two approaches, that there is a lot of reverse causality there, right? Yeah, we have to provide resources to the population to decrease poverty, to decrease inequality, so they can better plan their family size and so on. And so with lower poverty, we expect it to have uh, a decline in the in population growth, or at least like a restraint in the really sharp increases in population growth. So population growth is not going to increase so much. And at the same time, in some populations that we have seen still a huge population growth because of still high levels of uh, fertility, one way is to deal with that immediate problem by providing resources, birth control, and so on to people that maybe that's not going to solve their issue of poverty right there, but then that can alleviate population growth to the whole country and also for the family, and that will have effects on poverty. So you can uh, uh, deal with both issues. You can try to tackle poverty directly, and you can try to tackle population growth directly. And by doing that, their effects will be seen, right? But the idea is that it's not only population growth causes poverty as Malthus, and it's not only poverty causes population growth as Marx, is that both things, they go, they happen at the same time in a reverse causality uh, process. And we have to think about policies that deal with this complex process, okay? And then in more recent uh, decades, demographers, that's when they started to come up with those approaches, like we already discussed in the previous chapter, the demographic transition theory, right? And so in 1945, the demographic transition uh, theory came up in its original form. That's the process in where countries move from really high death and birth rates, and then it starts to decrease. But first, death rates decrease, and then afterwards, they are followed by declines in fertility, in birth rates. And uh, 1962, there were some early studies suggesting that each reformulate the demographic transition theory to try to understand specific issues that less developed countries faced uh, compared to more developed countries, and also uh, the effects of migration right, that some countries have it. So we have to complexify this analysis to understand it better. The theory of demographic change and response, demographic response made by individuals to population pressures is determined by the means available to them to respond. Causes and consequences of population change are interrelated. So see, in this discussion of theory of demographic change and response, you try, to, you try to emphasize the complexity of what is the cause and what is the consequence. So it's not so simple as population growth causes poverty or vice versa. It's an interrelated process and we have to act in different ways to deal with them uh, depending on the countries that we are, okay? Easterly in 1968 uh, came up with the relative cohort size hypothesis. Successfully larger young cohorts put pressure on young men's relative wages, forcing them to make a trade off between family size and overall well being. 1968, like around there, like by the end of the 60s and beginning of the 70s. That's when the baby boom cohort, those people born right after World War II, they start to enter the labor market, right? So they are uh, around 15, 20, 25 years old. And then um, right after the, the, the World War II, what was the baby boom? 
you have this huge increase in fertility. And those, that specific cohort had better educational opportunities. A lot of them went, got high school degree, a lot of them got college degree and so on. And when they finally entered the labor market, there are more of them competing for similar jobs. So that competition in the labor market makes their uh, earnings have a negative effect, right? The size of the cohort, the size of that specific group. And that will influence their decisions on having maybe fewer children, right? So, and this analysis is, I mean, that's exactly what I, I mentioned to you that my dissertation was about. We are trying to understand if larger groups of people in labor ages with better education in Brazil is affecting their earnings. In that case, we don't see such a negative effect because it's still the country doesn't have such a high proportion of the population with a college degree, still around only 10, 15% of the people. And then we absorb them. The economy absorbs them. But what Easter Lin was, saw, was uh, seeing with the baby boom cohort when they enter the labor market in the US is that that bigger cohort competing for jobs had a negative effect on their earnings. And as we try to understand all these different processes in which population changes, not just as population growth as a whole, but I want to understand each portion of demographic changes, I try to, what demographers try, uh, start to do more and more is to decompose, try to understand the different transitions in which uh, we see our population growing through, right? So what exactly are the changes in the most uh, common diseases that people have in more contemporary years? Uh, what are the causes of death that we have been seeing more contemporary societies compared to historical to previous years? How have been the changes in fertility? How many children people have? At what age people have children? And how that affects age structure? And how is migration, both international migration and internal migration, internal migration related to urbanization? And how that, all that postponing fertility, postponing age in which we got married or migrating from one area of the country to another or migrating from one country to the other, that changes family and household composition. Right, so we try to understand each one of the separated aspects that influence the overall demographic transition. And now, so this was just a, an overview to show you how uh, we pass through this centuries ago, this discussion in a more normative way of how population should be. And then we start to develop in a way that how we actually can understand or better understand the changes in, in population. So just going back here to some uh, more well-known demographers or sociologists, social scientists that tried to understand um, population. John Stuart Mill, a stationary population is better than a larger one. A large society will suffer from the growth rate of wealth not keeping up with the rate of population increase. What is a stationary population that I mentioned to you before in that discussion about from the tweet of Elon Musk? If you have the same number of births and then the same number of deaths for a long period of time, and also the age specific mortality rates don't change as much, you are gonna have a constant age sex distribution of your population. So wait, what exactly is that? If we get the mortality rates by age groups, 
mortality rates by age groups, age-specific mortality rates. What are the mortality rates from people between zero to one? One to four, five to nine, 10 to 14, until 85 plus. We get those rates, the mortality rates for each one of these age groups. Let's say that mortality declines so much that it's not gonna decline much more, it's not gonna increase. So it's gonna be expected to be constant over time. And more than that, we also uh, reach a, a step in our development of our society that the number of people being born and the number of people dying each year in this population is pretty much similar. So if we had an aging sex structure that looked like more a pyramid, a lot of kids, boys and girls, and now fertility is more control and the age uh, specific mortality rates is constant, we start to see this population to have a more rectangular shape, right? And that rectangular shape it's easier for us to project which kind of policies we're going to need for the future. It's easier for us to project what the government has to do in order to provide well-being for this population, right? For the future decades, for the future generations. So it's easier from policymakers to deal with population issues when we have a stationary population, right? But the reality is that we don't have a stationary population. The age-specific mortality rates, the mortality rates for each one of the age groups, they still vary a lot. And one example was now during the pandemic that it increased a lot. And also the number of people dying and being born in a specific country in a specific year is not the same. What we have been seeing, for example, in the US is that you still have more people being born than dying. So you have a population increase from one year to the other. But overall, a stationary population gives the government policymakers better, a better idea of how we can deal with population issues. And Emil uh, Durkheim, one of the classic sociologists that uh, sociology majors study a lot, Durkheim, Weber, and Marx. Durkheim, he kind of like classifies the human societies in two types, the mechanical societies and the organic. Mechanical, they're small populations. They are like smaller size and have a simple division of labor right? Usually you have a woman taking care of the activities in the household or man taking care of activities outside. Or if it's a little bigger, you still have some people uh, doing activities in agriculture, other people doing some kind of like service activities, but it's still really simple division of labor and it's small in size. As our society starts to increase in size, starts to get larger, we start to see an extensive division of labor in these organic societies. And then you start to have all different groups of people doing different activities in the economy, right? And uh, so it's just to emphasize that a classical sociologist has Emile Durkheim, if you think the way that he thought about societies, being more complex, having a more complex division of labor, a more simple division of labor, it is related to the size of the population, right? So his basic thesis from John Stuart Mill was that the standard of living is a major determinant of fertility levels. The idea we state is that in which all members of a society are economic, economically comfortable rather than seeking excessive wealth, at this ideal point, the population is stabilized and people will progress culturally, morally, and socially with the idea that the stationary population would actually be the ideal point in where everyone would think about, right? So some way also uh, 
kind of like normative in the way that how population should be. Emile Durkheim, a French sociologist who based an entire social theory on the consequence of population growth. Population growth leads to greater division of labor and more societal specialization. So as I mentioned in the previous slides, you, the size of the population is small. So you're gonna have a mechanical a society or a larger population, you're gonna have an organic society. The size of the population influences the division of labor, the complexity of division of labor in societies. The struggle for existence is more severe when there are more people in the long term, this leads to greater economic well being. So his point is that, okay, population growth in, in the short term, if um, it's, it's population growth in the short term can cause people to don't have enough resources to survive. But as this population gets larger, and we start to have a more efficient way in which we are organized with all this division of labor that will be good to the society as a whole and we will, will develop technologically, economically, and that it will affect our health as well in a positive way. And then we go to Malthus, uh, the most well-known early scholar who wrote about population growth and his study from 1798 and he say on the principle of population. And his main argument was that material resources, so pretty much food and habitation, can grow. We improve our ability to build more houses and to produce more food, all that, it grows, but in an arithmetic rate. It doesn't grow as fast as population grows. Populations, they grow at a uh, exponentially rate or geometric rate. And here, just to be clear, when I'm using these two terms, geometric and exponential rate, they are similar for this discussion here, right? I'm just saying that population growth grows, population grows much faster than our ability to produce food and to build habitation and and good life uh, standards for people. If we do not try to implement some kind of measures to prevent population growth, so if population growth is left unchecked, uh, it will grow exponentially and subsistence and our ability to produce food will grow as well, but in a um, a short, um, slower rate. And then he divides what are those possible checks, the possible checks that can make population don't grow as fast. And he divides them in two groups, the preventive checks and the positive checks. The preventive checks is uh, with the idea that we are preventing population to grow. So before it grows, let's make some, let's change some of our habits. Let's make some changes in our society right now that it will prevent population to grow so much. And that's moral restraint. So abstinence, postponement of marriage and so on. Right, so before the society gets into a really big population, what can we do before? Moral restraint and postponement of marriage. The positive checks, it's like once we reach this society that's really, really large and we don't have, we didn't grow as fast our ability to produce food and shelter for our population. So now we have this big population and not enough resources. Probably that will result in war, famine, pestilence, and other forms of misery and vice. And all those deaths caused by war, by poverty and so on, 
they will make population to decrease in size. Some people criticize Malthus just by using these terms, preventive checks and positive checks. I think Malthus can be criticized by other things, but just for the fact that he used this term here, positive checks, I think it's kind of like a silly way to, to criticize him. What he's pretty much looking here is the different time points in which we try to tackle the population growth. If we try to tackle it before, it's preventive checks. If we do not act on time, that will cause uh, societies to don't have enough resources and they will fight with each other. We're gonna have war, we're gonna have poverty and so on. So the positive checks here is not that he likes war. It's not that he likes poverty. It's not that he likes all these deaths. It's in his conception, his theory, in his theory, if population grows so fast, that's what we're gonna encounter. We can criticize Malthus, but we have to make the critic if we want in a more substantive way instead of just criticizing the term positive checks. And his work is uh, important. It influenced people in different sciences, Charles Darwin, Herbert Spencer, David Ricardo, Keynes, and many others. So biologists and economists, they were all influenced by this study of Malthus by saying that if population grows and usually grows much faster than our ability to produce food, it will cause poverty. And that will have uh, bad effects on our society, such as poverty, the, uh, increases in uh, diseases and war, okay? So Malthus argued that people have a natural urge to reproduce and the increase in food supply cannot keep up with population growth because our ability to produce food, it increases, we learn technologically, but it increases in an arithmetic way while population grows in a ge geometric rate. The major consequence of population growth is poverty. Poverty is the stimulus for action that can lift people out of misery. So exactly what I said before, population growth, independent variable causes poverty dependent variable. In order to avoid poverty, we have to act in order to don't let people go into poverty and have so bad things happen to them into the future, right? So that's his, uh, his major perspective. And it can be simplified in this graph here. That's not, that's more a theoretical example. It's not data from a specific country or anything. But it's with the idea that population, as we have been seeing for different countries and through different years, population increases really fast in exponential rate, right? Increase as fast as we saw these increases in, in people getting coronavirus cases or dying for coronavirus throughout the pandemic, right? An exponential rate. Our ability to produce food is also increases over time, but not as fast. So in a specific time point, our ability to produce food actually have more food than what is necessary for the population. We had food surplus, but we reach a specific time point that our technological advances, our knowledge about how to produce food doesn't give so much to us. And then we will have less food than it is needed to feed our population. So we're gonna have food deficit, okay? So what are some criticism about the Malthusian perspective. He did not consider that technological advances could increase food production 
to deal with population growth. And what is interesting, it's exactly that, like he wrote his book in 1798. And exactly in that period, uh, like Western societies were passing through the Industrial Revolution. And what was the, one of the major points of the Industrial Revolution was to all these advances that we start to have in our ways to produce, we produce much more, much faster with fewer resources than we had in the past. So from around 1760 to 1840, we have all these advances in technological advances, and now we produce more food in a faster way with fewer resources than we had before. And that was not accounted in his theory, right? Malthus described humans as no different than all living organisms, the ability to increase at the geometric rate, to increase the production of rate, right? Uh, no, so he did not differentiate humans to other human beings as them all increasing in size in a geographic rate. And in his view, we as human beings are all competing for space and resources. But the fact that he didn't realize that those changes that were going on right then when he was writing those, his theories about population was that exactly that moment of industrial revolution would change a lot of our societies, would dictate how we are today in our ability to control, to better control the environment and produce more resources to us. And so first criticism, he did not consider the technological advances that could increase for the production to deal with this fast population growth. Another thing, he was, uh, his major theory was that population growth would result in poverty, right? Population growth, the independent variable, poverty, the dependent variable. And uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, they rejected that notion because they were like, it's not population growth that causes poverty. The way that the capitalist society is organized in which there is so much inequality and poverty that you make some people even really low socioeconomic status and low educational levels have a lot of kids. So poverty influences population growth, right? So all this debate, this theoretical debate between uh, Malthus, Marx, and Engels happen exactly what is the cause and consequence, population growth or poverty. Another criticism, Malthus believed that moral restraint was the only acceptable preventive check. So because of his religious background, he, his main point was like, well, we cannot have birth control in our societies, right? So the way to restrain uh, fertility in order to avoid people having too many children was to avoid intercourse until marriage and only getting married when you had enough resources, when you were stable economically enough to have children, right? No, because exactly his uh, religious background, that's how he saw it, abstinence, postponing marriage. Some argue that he ignored the impact of contraception. Again, he was a clergyman who did not see contraception practices as moral. So he was against them. And he did not think that they were appropriate for the society to use as one of his preventive checks, okay? He never clearly actually defined uh, subsistence as food or means of subsistence, life standard, or exactly subsistence. It's just the ability to produce food. Is it having a good habitation, a good house? Is it having access to all basic infrastructure, treated water, sewer system? Is it related to a family having enough 
uh, access to good education. So what exactly is subsistence? Or subsistence is only related to food and shelter. And actually, the Malthusian principles were not valid for Europe or North America exactly because of all the advances that we saw with the Industrial Revolution. So with the Industrial Revolution, the increase in substance have far exceeded the human tendency to reproduce. Now, because of contraception, people postpone the age in which they have children. Contraception makes fertility decline. And we have a much better ability to produce food in a much faster way because of technological advances, and that we will not have so severe effects on our quality of life because population growth is now not growing so much faster because we have contraception and also because we can produce food in a faster way, okay? The overall thoughts of Malthus or his overall theory is still important among demographers. There are these criticisms. But if you think, uh, okay, contraception, yeah, that, that's good. We are not just going to build a whole theory based on my religious uh, beliefs. Contraception is good for the population to have access to. Moreover, I, um, I understand that industrial revolution and how our societies are organized nowadays, we can produce much more food for the growing population. But it's still, right? We still see some countries with really large populations and it's still with high levels of fertility that it could argue, if you had some policies there, some family planning programs to provide contraception to those people, maybe that would prevent, like in a really immediate way, their fertility, and then the population would not grow so much, and that would improve socioeconomic status of the whole population. That's not to say that only population growth affects poverty, but then we can also think about more long-term actions to change that society economically to produce to have a better economic production in order to, uh, in that case, economy, um, economic, economic development influencing population growth. So it's exactly what I talked to you before is that now when we are trying to understand why our societies change, we have to understand this complexity that goes in different ways. And by understanding that it goes in different ways, we don't just throw all the Malthusian theory into the side. We don't do that. We use a lot of his knowledge that helped us understand how populations, they, they grow. So new Malthusians agree that resources are limited, but argue that people should use birth control. But then you have, for example, Paul Einrich that I mentioned here before. He's a biologist who wrote a book in the 60s called Population Bomb that pretty much kind of said that human beings would have the same issues as the other animals. By growing too fast, we would uh, have issues of poverty and the population would enter into collapse. Garrett Hardin, the tragedy of the commons, the same idea. And Paul Einrich, it's one of the people that it's uh, interviewed in that short video made by the um, um, New York Times that's available in our course website, right? This one here I mentioned to you before is the population bomb. One of the people interviewed there is Paul Enrich. And, but he's criticized by the others because, in, because he still says, oh, I still think that our population is growing too much. And he gives examples of some countries. And we reach that issue that I have been talking for decades. And other people counter argument. No, it's not so simple like that. 
until when you're going to keep using the same arguments, although the data is showing something different. But what I think is important is to understand that we can try to solve issues of our population in different fronts. Contraception, family planning program, try to deal with the immediate growth in population, but also trying to change how our society is organized economically to also tackle problems with poverty and population growth, okay? The, so continuing here. The, and then Karl Marx, an economist and philosopher who disagreed with Malthus on his theory about population. Karl Marx's theory is all based on the, the idea that there are two classes of people in which the capitalist society is divided into. The capitalists, the bourgeoisie, and the workers, the proletariat. To Malthus, as I mentioned, population was an independent variable creating poverty. Poverty is the dependent variable. To Marx, population was actually the dependent variable. Population was the consequence of how our society is organized. Our society organized in, uh, in a capitalist way, in a capitalist system, is the main cause of poverty, not population. Regardless of fertility level, even if we control with uh, contraceptive methods, always the capitalists, the bourgeoisie will benefit the most, right? That's how the society is organized. Population growth, okay, okay, can be a problem. However, the potential difficulty can be regulated in a communist society. And his main point was, if you reach this communist society, population growth could be negative, but that society would kind of deal with that through some sort of public policies that would deal with the issue. But of course, he didn't enter into detail of how the communist society should be organized specifically. Some people criticize him for that, but some people say, oh, he could not imagine how the communist society would be. He was just saying that the capitalist society generates a lot of inequality, as we see nowadays, and we should aim to reach a society in which we, we don't have so much poverty and inequality among our inhabitants. So, but the whole debate here then is how do we deal with the issues that we have in society? That's a fact, right? We have poverty, we have inequality, we have population growth, and population growth is usually higher exactly among the people with lower socioeconomic status, the less educated. Those people have higher fertility that it will affect their lives in the future. How do we deal with that, right? If you think that there is not just one way of explanation, population explains poverty or poverty explains uh, population. If you understand that's a complex issue, you would try to tackle the problem in different ways. Let's try to control fertility with the, the idea of the new Malthusians, with family planning programs. But let's try to make some changes to our society, maybe continue to be a capitalist society, but in a way that more people have more resources and that can be done with public policies. Right? That's all. You're going to university, you're in social sciences, you go to uh, the Bush School, you go to sociology, you go to geography, you go to history, anthropology. We're all trying to make our society better through our actions, through public policies, right? So we are acknowledging that there are issues in our society. How to move forward, that's the big question, right? And there are different ways to deal with that. 
And of course, Marx influenced a lot of people. So his, this Marxian perspective that it's still uh, the basis of a lot of like theories that each society at each point in history has its own law of population that determines population growth. For capitalists, the consequences are overpopulation and poverty. In the capitalist society now, we have much more ability to produce more food and so on. And uh, if we don't care about population grow growing so fast, we can reach these really high levels of population sizes, and that can be linked to poverty. In socialist societies, population growth is readily absorbed by the economy with no side effects. Again, exactly how that would be achieved, it's what we are debating even nowadays, right? Major uh, criticism of Marx, he provided no guidance for how to get to what he called a socialist model. And here, always I just try to talk a little bit about the, the, the importance of the terms, right? I know that the term socialism, it's, it's more acceptable now, more positively viewed now in the US than it was in previous decades, but a lot, really, a lot of the American population see this word socialism as being negative, right? And, uh, and then you have contemporary politicians that even call themselves, for example, socialist Democrats. And what I was talking here to you before is that there are problems. We can see from the socioeconomic indicators, there is poverty, there is inequality. Poverty affects specific race ethnicity groups with higher chances. We have higher fertility exactly in those groups that have lower socioeconomic status. We have to deal with the issue, right? When we are trying to deal with the issue, we are trying to implement public policies to take people out of poverty and decrease inequality. That's not actually socialism. The term socialism in the US is both is used by both the left and right to describe that, but that's not socialism. Even for example, AOC and Bernie Sanders, they call themselves democratic socialists. If you look at their propositions, they are not socialists. They're social Democrats, social Democrats, social democracy. This term has been coined a long time ago. There in Europe, we have seen that develop a lot in Scandinavian countries, for example, and also in France, in Germany, there are a lot of these policies being implemented. Social democracy, not socialism. And I don't understand why the politicians nowadays in the US use a term that a majority, a big portion of the population, maybe not the majority, a big portion of the population sees it as negative, the term ne socialism, although they are not socialists, they are social democrats, right? But this difficulty with terms, I think is a intrinsic thing in the American society, right? You go there, get a sport, rugby that people play with their hands you guys change a little bit the rules put helmet on it instead of calling it american rugby you call it football but football already exists and then you call the real football soccer it doesn't make any sense right so i'm just saying that's important for us to understand the terms one thing is what we hear in the media one thing is what politicians use to say that's a positive or negative thing, but we have to understand the roots of the terms. We have to understand what exactly socialism and capitalism mean. Implementing policies in the capitalist society is not socialism, it's social democracy, right? I just like to bring up this discussion to bring this debate about theories of demography into our now, into our lives right now. All these things here are being debated right now in the US, right? In our contemporary societies. 
cool. And as we developed, we reach into a point that we can try to look at all these different changes that society pass through time in terms of improvement in mortality, declines in fertility, and we see different societies throughout several decades, centuries. And then that's when we start to see, you already have these theoretical approaches. Remember the deductive approach, right? The theories. And then you have the preliminary answers to your questions, the hypothesis, and then you collect data and then you confirm or not your hypothesis. And that makes the theory uh, stronger or weaker. But then you keep doing this until in uh, 1920s, 1940s, and 1960s, we come with this major explanation of how our societies developed through time in terms of the demographic components, focusing more on fertility and mortality. So the demographic transition theory is the most prominent explanation for population growth. It is also known as the classic demographic transition or first demographic transition developed by Thompson, 1922, and then Nottenstein and Davies uh, developed even further, okay? So the changes in the size of the world's population over a certain period of time are due to changes in the levels of fertility and mortality. The reason that our population uh, size doesn't grow as fast as before is because we have seen declines in mortality followed by declines in fertility. There are four stages as discussed in the textbook, as I mentioned to you guys before, we divide in four stages. One of the figures that uh, simplifies the demographic transition theory divides in five stages, but we going to be focused on these four stages. There are four stages of mortality and fertility change in the process of modernization of our societies. In pre-industrialized societies, we have high birth and death rates, exactly because a lot of people are being born, but a lot of them are dying. Population doesn't grow as much. And then we see the process of industrialization and modernization that help us control mortality. So mortality declines really fast. And, but mortality declines, we start to have lower death rates, but still fertility doesn't decline as much. People culturally are still having a lot of kids or more kids than what we have nowadays, because that's what the previous generations also had. So mortality declines a lot, Fertility continues in high levels. Many more people being born than die. You have intense population growth. And then people start to realize, hey, yeah, I don't have to have so many children for them to survive to adult ages. And it's also expensive to have children. And also have to uh, provide more resources to the children that I have. Then you start to see declines in fertility then you start to see lower birth rates as well as lower death rates. When both of them are start to decline, population growth doesn't uh, decreases. So we don't have such a strong population growth anymore. It still may be more people being born than dying, but population doesn't grow as fast. And then in some more contemporary societies in developed countries, we reach really low levels of fertility and mortality, and we have slightly fluctuations. And any natural increase or decrease are usually, usually due only to fertility. But one of the things that I have been trying to show to you here, like more recent analysis, for example, between 2019 and 20, life expectancy at birth in the U.S. fell from around, by around 1.5, two years of life. So that's the pandemic effect in mortality. So 
does that affect the overall size of the population? That's what we're going to see in these next years. But overall, we saw during the pandemic that the mortality is not so controlled as we thought before. In one year, we decreased life expectancy in the U.S. by around 1.52 years of life, as we saw already in, the, in those previous studies that I showed here in the classroom, right? So, yeah, as we were reaching really low levels of mortality, what actually increases, what actually causes population growth or decline are the levels of fertility. But mortality is not going to always be in so low levels if we don't deal with these public health issues in a more efficient way. Okay. The same figure that I showed you guys before. Stage one, the pre-transitional, pre-industrialization stage, in which you have high levels of fertility and mortality. Mortality declines during the trans transitional stage, where you see industrialization and modernization. And the difference here in birth and death rates, you have a huge population increase. Fertility declines. The difference between fertility and mortality is not so high. Population still increases, but not as fast as we saw in stage two. So fertility begins to decline, but then we reach a stage four in which sometimes fertility declines or increases. And whether we have population growth or population decline is usually more uh, influenced by the levels of fertility. And this is that other figure that I showed you guys before, that it subdivides the previous stage three into stage three and four here. All the questions that we have in the textbook are related to this figure if you're talking about stages of the demographic transition. But what I like about this one, it's kind of like uh, better explains here which one of the stages in, in terms of birth, death rates, and natural increase, but also it shows the trends of population. Population increasing really strong on stage two when fertility declines fast. And then it keeps increasing, but not as fast on stage three because we see declines in, in fertility. And as fertility starts to decline, population increases, but not as much. And then you reach the point that in some cases, you could have fewer births than deaths, and then your population can decline. Okay. So some examples in the world, the transition, uh, the demographic transition theory began in 1700 and later in Europe, and is not complete in most of the less developed countries. Many African and Eastern European countries are in, uh, early in stage three. So we start to see now uh, declines in fertility in some of these countries. So they are early here and still fertility high. So a lot of these uh, African and Middle Eastern countries. Some in Latin America are moving actually towards stage four in which we have really low levels of fertility, as well as here in the US. And all these variations change population distribution, right? We saw in those tables that I showed in the previous lecture, the projection of the population by continent, that we expect that the population in Africa will increase from 1 billion nowadays to around 4 billion by 2100 based on those estimations that Hans Rosling showed us. And that increase will cause a change in population distribution across continents, higher proportion of people living in uh, African countries. Right? The beginning of the 20th century, the majority of the population resided in more developed countries. And throughout the 20th century, high population growth, uh, we see high population growth and reversal of population distribution. Throughout the 20th century, you see high population growth, but mostly in less developed countries. And then, then you start to see a higher percentage of the population living in less developed countries. So in 2014, over 83% of the population lived in less developed countries and under 17% lived in more developed countries. By the 21st century, the share of less developed countries 
uh, of the population of less developed countries will increase even more, right? That's one of the things that Hans Rosling discussed in his videos. We usually have all this classification of countries, like more developed countries, less developed countries. And he said, oh, I came up with an easier way. You have the more developed countries that's becoming smaller and smaller in population size and all the others, just call them the world, right? I just think it's funny that he says that because we try to make these classifications, but the more developed countries become so small that actually everything else is the whole world. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, the quiz is now open. Since we did not cover all the chapter about theories of demography, it's going to be about topics that we discussed before. And I see you guys on Thursday. Thank you.